Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Heavy Hands. I am your host, Connor Rebush. With me, as always, Phil McKenzie. Well, 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 Connor. Yes? You try to call last week, you were saying to all the listeners, and to me, how much everyone should be looking forward to Mario Batista. Now he was the most exciting fighter <laughs> oh, okay. that we'd ever seen in MMA. <laughs> but he was the probably the next champion. And yet... Oh, we're going to have to get to this later in the episode, but mm-hmm. all I'm saying is I think everyone will be expecting apologies, including me. He's exposed himself as a coward and me a fool for supporting him, Mario Batista. Sh- you know... It's one thing to beat Jose Aldo, but to 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 shame yourself in the process is it even worth it? Might as well just lose. Is it even worth it? The answer is coming up later, but it is yes. <laughs> 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 UFC three hundred seven is indeed going to be the topic for this week's episode, and we are going to get to Mario Batista, Jose Aldo. Shit, I'm just happy I picked that one correctly. Um. Mm-hmm. First up, of course, though, we are going to have to get to some other fights, uh, namely the main event, which was Alex Pereira versus the, uh, in one sense, uh, somewhat undeserving Khalil Roundtree. In another sense, uh, I don't think there's another light heavyweight in the division who would have had this fight with Alex Pereira. So he deserved it mm-hmm. more than all the rest of them. This was genuinely a high level fight. In fact, I'll say this now. As uh, as the preeminent ambassador from the world of chess, the game of kings, to uh, the world of MMA, you have my permission. What's the what's the word for uh, second to preeminent? The you're eminent. Penult and eminent. It's the Roman the Lidze. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. He's number one. As the vizier to the ambassador from the world of chess to that of <laughs> MMA, you have my permission to describe Alex Pereira versus Khalil Roundtree as a chess match. You're finally allowed to use that comparison. This was a chess match. It's good. Adjustments are being made. Nice, steady simmer. Kyle McLaughlin calls these uh, two-way technicals. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I thought this was a fantastic example of that and much better than I expected. And, um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking about it. Of course, unfortunately, we also have to discuss Raquel Pennington, Juliana Pena. Uh, yeah. which might take the cake as, uh, MMA fight with the least footwork ever. Uh, yeah, maybe you're right. Really, truly. I mean, uh, we're, we're going to talk about that as well. And of course, Aldo versus Batista, uh, Kayla Harrison had a bit of a wake up call, um, performance on this card as well. And, uh, there was some other stuff as well that we may get to, but first up Alex Pereira, Khalil Roundtree, take it away, Phil. Tell me, uh, tell me about this, this close competitive fight between the possibly biggest star in the sport and the, I believe, number eight ranked light heavyweight contender. So did you get the same feeling that I did, which is when this fight started and Khalil Roundtree threw like two punches Mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, this is going to be different Mm -hmm. from what I thought it was. This is going to be tough. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Immediately, like as soon as he did anything, I was like, "Man, uh, Kurt Roundtree is a uh, fighting for his space, and B. I don't think I've uh, quite, I think I, I'd quite recognized it because I honestly don't think he'd looked like this before. But Khalil Roundtree is fast as fuck." Yeah, he's always been fast, but I, I think he, it, it looked like, as often happens, he, um, he kind of reached a new level of, of focus and consistency in preparation for his title shot. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, he's always been fast, but he's not usually so relaxed. 
um, that that speed, you know, he usually has the, uh, the Josh Emmett problem. He's really fast, yes. but he also loads up so much that he slows himself down and he, he makes himself easier to time. And in this, he was yep. just letting the hands fly. They were shockingly fast. Honestly, I, early on, I was kind of surprised Pereira was avoiding as many as he was. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was just the first thing that jumped out at me. And yeah, the the directionality that he took in terms of the fight is that, yeah, Roundtree was fighting for his own like scrap of space. Uh -huh. He was doing exactly what we kind of wanted uh, and have been saying for people to do against Pereira, which is to like throw combinations to push him backwards. Yeah. Often like right from the jump, like quite smart, clever combinations. I particularly liked when he did the um it didn't it didn't quite work, but it just showed him that he was like inputting he was giving Pereira things to think about when he did like the, the soft step in to the left hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, because he was loading up the, the right hook behind it. Um, like somewhere in the first round. So, yeah, I mean, he just, he came prepared. Like, as you said, I think he was dialed in in a way that we haven't seen before, but also like willing to take the fight to Pereira in a way that we mm -hmm. didn't really think he was going to. And I don't think there was any reason to assume that he was going to. Um, and yeah, immediately I was like, oh, this is going to be much tougher than, much tougher than anyone thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's still most of the fight. It was, I would say probably 65% of the fight, uh, that had any directionality. It was Pereira pressuring, but Roundtree mm -hmm. was able to drive him back repeatedly. In fact, this was the one thing that annoyed me most, um, by a long shot about Pereira was, how consistently he dealt with any threat by just leaping straight back out of the pocket. Yeah. Um, then again, one of the times he tried to slip a shot and stay in range, he did get head kicked. So <laughs> maybe he was just thinking better safe than sorry. Um, still, it got him into trouble a little bit. He was still able to roll with most of the shots that came at him when he was retreating like that, but it did let Roundtree chase him. And I would say... If Roundtree had had a real pressure mode to kind of tap into, he might have been able to turn that into a, a real momentum swing rather than just uh, catching Pereira at a couple key moments, you know? Because um, he was really just leaping straight back out of the pocket a lot. As for... Yeah. Uh, yeah, go on. Uh, I was going to say, like, in terms of uh, the... So I think it was a very good performance from Roundtree, but as you know, with all surprises, there's often you know we, we always say this. This is a two a two way street. Uh, despite how it was at the end and how it looked at the end, it did not, at the very least, start off as a very good performance from Alex Pereira. I did not think he was yeah doing a good job of mi of uh, minimizing Roundtree's chances to have a like a competitive fight with him and one where his his speed could tell. And this was the one thing that we didn't really bring up uh, last week, which I was thinking about last weekend. Still never did, because we, we mentioned it all the time. Which is like, how well is um, Pereira going to fight against the Southpaw? Well, I got one to... massive gold star for him. He used his jab mm -hmm. a lot. Turns... Used his jab... A lot. As the fight went on. Eventually. Yes. He, he I found think it. That's the... He found it and he was looking for it in the first round, but yes, it wasn't until probably round three and round four that it became a really, really big part of his attack. He was willing to use it though. I'll give him credit for that. Uh, yeah, and, and but this was not a, uh, push the, this was not a push the opponent back look to uh, draw responses out of them kind of approach from Pereira. This was, I mean, it was to some extent in that he was at least crowding Roundtree physically enough that uh, that Roundtree eventually just started to give ground because, mm -hmm. you know, as, as as was sort of inevitable, Roundtree, as much as Roundtree wanted to approach the fight in a 
in a smart way, that's not really how Khalil Roundtree fights. No. And eventually he did, as he was, you know, he had to. That's just, you know, how life is. He he eventually sort of resorted to, uh, you know, drifting backwards against the cage, looking for counter punches and so on, particularly as he got tired. And that's just, yeah. that's just how most all fighters are. Very few can just slip on a new style like a coat. Mm-hmm. And certainly not uh, someone like Khalil Roundtree. Yeah. Um, I get the sense though that you're you're a little more down on this performance from Pereira than than I am. I, I didn't think I have my issues with it. The jumping back out of range is just a, a bad habit uh-huh. that he's always had. Um and certainly, yeah, he made a couple other very um risky decisions trying to force things, taking some gambles, one of which uh got him dropped. Not badly hurt, but certainly dropped on the counter when he went for a high kick that Roundtree came under and then threw the right hook. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, I also thought it was a very, um, mature, patient performance from Pereira, who, like, his unflappability really came through in this fight. Because if you're watching yes. it thinking, I picked him to win, this is going to be easy. Imagine the shock that would be for somebody in Pereira's position <laughs> to come into a fight maybe thinking that and be like, oh shit, this guy's got something. This is difficult. I'm going to have to solve this. And um, at no point did it really feel like Pereira was, this is weird to say, because he did get dropped, didn't feel like he was in trouble, like at any point. I mean, you never got the impression that he didn't think he was going to win. Right. He was he, just he composed. He wasn't sure he was going to win. Composed and went back to the pressure. And it's like he just knew if he kept this pressure on and dialed it up and, and, and stayed closer and closer to Roundtree as the fight went on. Which is really something to look at. Watch the first round, any exchange in the first round, and then jump to the third and look at how close yeah. these dudes are standing to each other. Um, he just knew that as long as he kept that up, he was going to break round tree. And he was right. He was absolutely right. So I, I actually, I was, I was pretty impressed by Panetta here. I just thought that round tree did a, round tree had the fight of his life. I think he, you know, it was, it was his usual game, but, he looked more relaxed. I mean, speaking of unflappability, he, he held up to Pereira's pressure and even like, um, got tired by the end of the first round and then kind of bounced back and found his confidence in round yep. two. He was, he was swaggering out there and looking really, really comfortable against this. Yeah, it's much more of a, um, sort of Rose Nami Yunus. Yeah. Kind of thing where he was. You know, slowing down towards the ends of rounds and then coming out with a yeah, with a burst at the at the at the start of the next yeah. And I mean, I was wondering what a, a round the start of a round five would have looked like. I'm very glad it got stopped when it did. Yeah, uh, but had Pereira not, you know, finally realized that he could hit something other than Khalil Roundtree's face, uh, at which point he immediately finished the fight. Had he not realized that. We are getting close to the end of the round. Who knows if Roundtree might have recovered enough to at least make something happen at the start of the fifth? Because Pereira was feeling the pace as well at that point. He was really hunting that finish for like three minutes straight almost. Uh-huh. Uh, and putting a lot of energy into his swings. So, yeah, Roundtree definitely showed that um, recoverability of gas tank. But just mentally, he was so uh, resilient and... Uh, calm. And I think that's why the speed really came through as well. As I said, the, uh, just the relaxation that Roundtree was fighting with made him all that much, uh, faster than he usually is. And, you know, to be fair, he was very dialed in on the right hook counter. I can, yeah. can see why. We talked about it. Uh, but there was, was, you know, increasingly as the fight went on, he was trying to, uh, Use the jab. He was trying to open with his jab when he was sure that Roundtree was stepping backwards, mm-hmm. and that, that Roundtree wasn't going to be like lunging forward over the top with the right hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it broadly, I thought a very strong performance from Pereira. It was just in the details mm-hmm. where you have issues. For example, the the calf kicks were also not as consistent a factor as they might have been. They were very effective. <laughs> As was the jab. Uh, but he took a minute to build up to these things. 
And I thought he tried a little too much to kind of, I thought he was hunting for the knockout blow a little too much in the early going. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a bit too much of a classic uh, MMA fighter fights as a fight. Yeah. Going for looking high for kicks the, and. Yeah. Looking for, he didn't actually throw the body kick much, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Looking for high kicks. Looking for the big punches, not not having to work his way into using his jab, not using his low kicks as much, and so on and so forth. Like it was, it was that drop in pace that you always expect when you suddenly see an open stance fight in yeah. MMA. It was very noticeable from uh, Panera's end, and yeah, a pleasantly a surprise from uh, Roundtree's mm-hmm. end that he actually upped his. Yeah, so I don't even know that I've um well we could talk about um we could talk about the the process of Pereira sort of coming to the winning approach. I found that pretty interesting. Okay. He had to um he did settle into uh what you uh, mentioned before. He settled into a kind of fight where he was trying to use the pressure to draw shots out of Roundtree and then counter him. There were some hiccups yep. along the way. Uh, where he was trying to line up the counters and actually getting caught, um, getting surprised by the fact that Roundtree was consistently throwing in combination. And usually it was that right hook at the end that would, it didn't land clean a ton, but it certainly forced him to reset, um, nearly every time it came out. And, um, in particular, it was Pereira looking for the, uh, like slip two, three counter. That ended up being the big combination that, um, started the very long finishing sequence. And, uh, it took him a while to kind of fine tune that one. Um, this is what I really liked about this. Like, I just felt that, um, both guys were really engaged in the, in the struggle, in the tactical battle. You know, both guys were really locked in, paying attention to the patterns their opponents were showing them trying to create threats. They, I, I could tell that Roundtree could sense when like he was losing too much initiative and he had to make something happen. I just felt this is a, a lot of times you get a fight like, like Pennington Pena, for example, where it, it feels like, um, neither fighter is, knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. They've kind of lost the plot. And, uh, I don't think that was ever the case in this fight. I felt even when he was still, no, that is very, very true. I don't think either of these guys. They were in, in the, yeah, in the broad brushes. I think both of them knew what they had to do. I think Pereira, I think naturally it ended up kind of sinking into a, a more favorable Pereira matchup because, yeah, uh, Roundtree simply started retreating more often as you would expect. Pereira started wearing him down more as you would expect. Yeah. But yeah. They both knew, Pereira both, Pereira knew, I need to press forward on this guy and break him down. And Roundtree knew, I need to stop that from happening. I need to fight my corner. Yeah. And, 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 and throughout that whole process, both guys were very engaged with, uh, like I said, the, the, the patterns they were getting from their opponents and really engaged in the process mm-hmm. of trying to open their opponent up and trying to draw things out and defend things so that they could then punish them. It was a really, uh, engaging like tactical struggle that they had uh Pereira oh was God, not I just i was just watching it in the background and in round three a round tree landed a body shot yeah he lands that big body kick is that the one you're talking about no he landed a body punch he landed a right hook to the body what oh i remember that one yes. yeah yeah they oh were... i yeah it's <laughs> they, they, like they... the one because that was the other, the other thing about like Pereira finding the body work to uh put sort of put Roundtree away at the end, is that that also would have worked good for Roundtree, as he does... Oh, he, he just threw a uh, left straight to the body as well, I think. Yeah, there, if, there's a couple. In fighting a big, tall guy that leans away, and he'd been more consistently working the body. Um, yeah, a little 1-1-2 one, one, yeah, did... to the body as uh, Pereira's leaping back. That would have gotten in a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this was... Um, this was something that... Uh, 
I think Hexerized said on Twitter that I was I'd, I was also thinking about watching this fight. Uh huh. Um, which is that like, Pereira sort of hasn't just been helped by the most broad MMA style to make fights brush and in terms of the matchmaking that he's had, you know, it's not just been that he's just been fighting strikers, although that is true. Uh-huh. It's the, that he's fighting very specific strikers. Um, and as is the case much of the time in, uh, MMA, the actual style matchup to beat him probably just doesn't really exist in light heavyweight. You know, there is no, you know, if, if you were like, Who's the the closest analog to like Vakitov? In, yeah. Uh, in at light heavyweight, even as a striker, that or, really as doesn't, anything that and doesn't be, And you've got to be like, you'd be like, is it Iwan Kutalaba? Before he got scared. I mean, and that's a that's a no. shameful comparison. <laughs> it's not Iwan Kutalaba. That's an ins- insulting comparison. I, I know, but like, uh, <laughs> what else can you reach for? There's yeah, there isn't there isn't a fighter like that. There really isn't. And this, you know, this does, uh, you know, this this happens a lot through MMA, as I said. Like, it, 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 a lot of the time, it causes people to like paste uh, traits and characteristics from like that don't exist onto onto fights. Like, you know, when everyone knew that Anson Silva probably wasn't actually that good at, at defending takedowns, mm. or uh, people just hoped their way into who wanted him to lose, just hoped their way into uh, both the ability to create offense from Nate Marquardt or the ability to create wrestling exchanges from Yushin Nakani that simply didn't exist. Right. Or like John Jones, for the example, for example, you know, uh, went so I went so long, like, looking for someone with moderate cardio, a kicking game and moderate takedown offense that I just instantly pulled the trigger on Tiago Santos when he fought him as a, <laughs> as a title challenger. Um, so yeah, it is, you know, it, it, it was a super fun, awesome fight. It is once again, a, a reminder that there is the uh, Pereira has, you know, this was a matchup sort of made for Pereira to look good. Uh, and it's a credit for to Roundtree that he managed to make it as exciting and fun as it was. Yeah. But that there's also like not that much reason unless uh Ankaliath remembers how to you know what he's good at. <laughs> so no re- there's no chance that at these all. things are gonna change in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um I don't know. I do love watching Pereira fight, though. You know, whatever. Yeah. Not my. As I said like, he's he, he's also yeah. We've said it so many times. He's someone who's genuinely just gotten way unequivocally way better. At yeah, this stuff. I mean, com- yeah. Just compare this. I, I know they're just uh, striking battles, but he's a uh, sort of uh, not only um, introduced a couple of things that were not prevalent in his kickboxing game, but also brought out all the things that he sort of paired away from his full kickboxing game. In a much, uh, it's been a much faster progression than the one we saw from, say, Ioana and Jacek, mm-hmm. who also sort of became more of the kickboxer she used to be as her career went on. But for for Pereira, it's it's more than that. I mean, he's he's not just uh, uh, already like constantly bringing in the like step knees, for example, which are a huge part of many of his kickboxing knockouts. Uh, not just bringing in the jab and the sort of slip and counter boxing approach that he loved to use in the ring. Um, but he's also developed, uh, this devastating low kick game, which was like not his wheelhouse at all as a kickboxer. Probably wouldn't have been as effective as a kickboxer because people check low kicks. Yeah. But, uh, it's, uh, it's but, a, yeah, just as. His, yeah, his jab and low kick game is just genuinely really nasty now. Even for people who are really good at checking low kicks. True. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, un- I mean, he's unequivocally, I think, the most, just like the kickboxer who has improved as a kickboxer. 
in MMA. Yeah. Like the most, like uh, far beyond, like Israel and Sun, you pretty much just got, just got worse. Yeah, that's true. This is the only kickboxer <laughs> other than Joanna who's gotten better at kickboxing in MMA the longer he's done it. I mean, maybe you could say Overeem, but I don't know, man. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, at least that would be, it would, it would certainly be up in the air, but like, you just look up at it, it's just, he's just much better than he used to be. Yep. Yeah, and I thought this and that's was another uh, reason why, like, yeah, unless unless someone figures out uh, a way to, you know, a way to to change the style matchup, just gonna keep getting fights like this, or and, and, you know, until someone you know gets a one big punch on him that knocks him out again. Yeah, that'll happen. It almost happened here. Um, yeah, but or it'll be... There aren't um, as many people who are, who are as purely explosive as Khalil Roundtree. I hope Ankalaev fights him, and it's exactly the same as his fight with Jan Blachowicz. Where he doesn't even well, he think... absolutely smoked him yeah, and, yeah. and then just uh, smushes him on the ground for the last two rounds. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't even think about wrestling until his leg is just like a pulp from the knee down. And then, mm-hmm. he's, and then he starts winning the fight with his grappling. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's, I mean, who else is left? Roundtree wasn't certain, well, already wasn't at the top of the heat. Um, I'm certainly glad they made the fight now. Uh, cause Nikita I, Nikita Krylov. Kry, yeah, Krylov, uh, who will wrestle everybody. So at least that's a threat that exists. Uncle Iev, I don't know, but I don't think anybody else is, uh, honestly going to, uh, bring the best out of Pereira. Um, nor do I think it, um, Pereira is going to bring the best out of anybody else the way he did to Khalil Roundtree here. I thought that this this was just a fight where the guys just elevated each other, just a yeah edge of your seat. Every single action matters. Uh, both guys so calm and uh, you know this was just a high level uh, striking battle as far as it goes in uh, in MMA. It really was. Very impressive. And on that note, let's take a break. When we come back, Raquel Pennington, Juliana Pena, after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. Let's talk about the co-main event. The women's bantamweight title was on the line. Women's bantamweight title, you say? That doesn't exist anymore. Ronda Rousey and Amanda Nunes are dead. There is no women's bantamweight title. Well, that's where you'd be mistaken. It was buried, it was buried with them. <laughs> that's where you'd be mistaken. A woman who would never have ever come close to beating either Ronda Rousey or Amanda Nunes is now the bantamweight champion. And um, that's Raquel Pennington. What are you talking about? She did beat Amanda Nunes. Did no? Oh, yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Was that the bulldog choke fight? No, what was her bulldog joke? Because that was your call for this, as I, as I remember. A terrible call, by the way. Um, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> she was just losing any I didn't time. realize that Juliana Pena still thinks she's a striker. Yeah, or also... But, uh, I did, to be fair, but I just thought she would... You you also must not have realized the extent to which, nor did I, that Pena would just easily dominate Pennington on the ground. Yeah. There was be like it would be completely in her grasp whenever she did that, but she still wouldn't do it enough to win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a this is sort of a two way uh, worst brain thinking fight almost. Um, I I gotta say, I don't think I have. I, I mentioned this at the top of the show, but this really is the main. This is the 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 crux of this fight for me. I don't think I've ever seen a fight. With less like proactive footwork. 
You know, like where like you're standing in front of somebody and you can't. I'll, I'll make a comparison for the uh, for the other sports heads out there. Any any soccer fans out there? I know you love the footy, Phil. Oh uh, yeah, so much. <laughs> On a soccer field or a football pitch, as it were, you don't try to score goals down the center, do you? You learn this when you're a mm-hmm. eleven year old uh, or younger. You have to run the ball up the sides of the field and then cross it into the center for the goal shot, right? Because if you try to go up the middle, there's a bunch of traffic. You just, you, you, the, not only is the goalie there, but you just, all the defenders are clotted together in the middle of the field. There's no open lane. So you have to go around the wings in order to break open through the center. And this is the same in combat sports. You have to, if you're standing in front of somebody and you're jabbing and they're, and they're just like blocking your jabs or you're eating a jab every time you try to step in with one, you go to a side. <laughs> Either one, really. It's your choice. You step to the side and then you try to jab and maybe you'll get in because you've gone around the things that are in your way. But this was a fight <laughs> where both fighters just stood directly in front of each other sort of looking confused that they couldn't quite seem to like break through and get in for free on the other. And that went on for the better part of, of, uh, well, there was some grappling. So probably the better part of 20 the minutes. Whole fight. Yeah. The yeah. entire fight, as long as they were on the feet, it was defined by that, that they would just stand in front of each other. If something came their way, they would step straight back and then they would just kept trying to come straight in and go straight back out. They didn't even take an angle on like the exits after stepping in to throw. Neither Pennington nor Pena. It was just straight in, straight out, and that's why it sucked. That's why it had the feeling of a fight where the same fucking exchange keeps happening over and over and nothing is what a contrast to the main event, Phil. These guys are so locked in, they're both trying to progress, you know, the story of the fight to their own ends, trying to adjust to each other. And in this they just like nobody knew what was going on. Everything that happened was an accident. <laughs> it was a complete mess of a fight. I mean, they were trying to adjust, but it was simply over the. Um, it was adjusting to like the one thing that was happening, which yes. was how do we how do we close? How do you close distance? And what at what time do you close this? Do you close distance? Yeah. So these are the questions, um, of course, that should be preoccupying a champion. Yeah. How how do you close but distance? Like Pena's again? thing was that she could. Pena's thing was that she can actually throw a straight punch, and that uh, just the one. She generally takes like one step when she comes in. Yeah. And uh, Pennington's thing was that she can't throw a straight punch. And also needs to like take a little run up, like would like drop three or four times on the uh, like scuttle as she was, she was coming in. <laughs> she really um, did. She was trying so much like arcane bullshit to try to, co- to give a different look to get in, like stance switching. Mm-hmm. I'm like, just step to the side for fuck's sake. <laughs> just <laughs> what? That's it. You're overcomplicating it so much. Quit trying to reinvent the goddamn wheel. Just step to the side and then jab. Because it was, yeah, because they were both entirely focused on uh, the. I'm not sure what game to, uh, you know, you compared it to uh, to, ch- to the, the Pereira fight to chess. I don't know what game you you would uh, ascribe this to, but it's. I know what it is. It's it's slap fighting. It, it is the thing where like you you know you hold out your hand and then the other person tries to hit it and then you pull your hands away. Oh yes, that slap that fighting. Thing. Not Dana White slap fighting. Yeah, not not the uh, yeah not the the Dana White. Yeah, thing. the, the yeah, yeah you try to the, smack the back of their hand game. Yeah, yeah, that thing. That's because what it was. So totally dialed in on trying to fake out the point of entry, and because that was the only, as you said, it was the only way that they were. Yes. Looking at the fight, yeah, like this is what it is. This is the entirety. It is this moment. How do I disguise my either uh, single giant step into yes. left hand or right hand, 
or by a little like scuttling sprint that leaves a small Looney Tunes esque cloud behind me. You you have hit the nail that's, on the head. That that's, that was the question forward. preoccupying the fighters. How do I get in? That was it. That was the whole fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it sucked. <laughs> was not good <laughs> it was a, not a pleasant viewing experience i gotta be honest um yeah i was really you know i i, I have a soft spot for uh for rocky pennington you know she's she, she's certainly a an unathletic striver after my after my own heart mm-hmm. and um but man like you see flashes of good boxing for her you see she's got like surprisingly fast hands um she has a jab. She had a lot of success doubling, tripling, quadrupling the jab. Like Pena's jab. I said right at the beginning of the fight to myself, oh no, Pennington forgot to come out southpaw. The Pena's jab is going to work. Mm-hmm. And it did. It was a problem. And she didn't really solve it in any way, but she did just start doing more jabbing of her own. And Pena, as it turns out, can only throw one jab at a time, really. Yep. Um, unless she's just sort of haplessly pawing with her lead hand. So then that was kind of a small, but there were no real like momentum swings. There were a couple moments. I mean, there kind of, there, there kind of was in terms of what happened because the penny just got knackered and. Yeah. Well, uh, like could throw her single over committed shots less than, uh, and Pennington could like throw double and triple jabs. Yeah. So you had a fight where basically the first round was very close, and I think you know Pennington probably lands more meaningful shots, but who really cares? Yeah. And then like two rounds of mostly pretty inert top control from Benya. Uh, ab- absolutely um, inert. Yes. And uh, then yeah, two rounds where she mostly just gets tired and gasses out and gets beaten up a bit, but I then uh, still occasionally can. Just throw one big shot down the middle. Yeah. Yeah. I actually forgot that uh, Pena won. As we were talking about this mm-hmm. just now, that's how inconclusive the fight was. I actually totally forgot she won. And I think when it happened, I was kind of annoyed by it. I was like, that's not the right decision. And now I just don't. I mean, I get, it's one of those ones where. Yeah. As far as, uh, you know, the narrative of the, and we will have more to say about this later on, as far as the narrative of the fight goes, it feels very wrong, because you're like, this person right. is clearly losing more as the fight goes on. They have been, to the extent that they can be, and the fight is this limited, solved. Yeah. Uh, but then they, they, they get away with the win. Uh, but the actual, as I said, the actual... Scoring basically just comes around to a first round where, you know, I think Pennington probably wins it, but you're not going to get a yeah strong, uh, it's, it's not a strong scorecard from my perspective. Yeah, I'm actually curious to, uh, to look up the scorecards. I wonder, uh, if there's any fuckery. If, I swear if Pena p- has picked up one of those last two rounds on one of these scorecards. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be miffed. Let's see. Uh, no, it all looks pretty normal. Pretty much the two judges who gave it to uh, Pena, they gave her the first round. Yeah, and no, that's that fair is... enough. As I said, don't think she won it, but it's close enough that it's not egregious at all. Yeah, I did feel it was wrong. I just I find no passion in my heart whatsoever regarding this fight now in the cold light of day. I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. No, Pennington didn't really. Yeah, and I said it's. I like Rocky Pennington, but you, as with uh, Bilal Muhammad, Gilbert Burns, you got to be able to also point out when you a fight you like has a real stinker. I mean, my God, like just she got so much pressure going as the fight went on, but even in the rounds she was clearly winning in those last two, it was really just winning it because Pena was exhausted. Because like the, her approach didn't change. She didn't. She didn't add any new tools. She didn't find any new entries. It's like the whole fight was preoccupied with how do I get in, and then like when she was starting to allow to be getting to get in, she didn't know. How, she still didn't know how to what to do with it. 
So I guess I just keep doing the double jab and then occasionally put a right hand behind it. And oh shit, I dropped her like the first time I did put a right hand behind the jab. Just a a nice, pretty short right hand. I'm not going to do that again for another four minutes. Maddening. Yeah, that was cool. I did like the head kick and the uh, knocking her down by the cage. Yeah, but then where did that go? What did that lead to? She was just like somehow back to square one after those moments. Crazy. So, yes, now we have, I believe, what the UFC always hoped for, which is uh, Kayla Harrison, Juliana Pena. Great. Uh, Kayla Harrison, who set the world on fire in her own. uh, (laughs) Yeah. She had a real struggle just to against an opponent who was like, well, I'm, I'm, my goal is not to get taken down. So what are you going to do? And she, mm-hmm. she, that was, it turns out nobody's thought of that before. Don't let Kayla Harrison take you down. Turns out it, it makes the fight pretty difficult for her. Um, yeah. I suppose we could talk about that one now since we've only talked like 10 minutes on the co-main. Do you want to talk about Kayla Harrison briefly while we're on the subject? Oh. She, um, she, um, doesn't really have a striking game. Oh. She had, uh, a left hand and a left kick, and she could change the, uh, level, particularly with the left kick. And that was a switch up that yielded some results. And in particular, the left hand made for a nice entry for, I mean, one of the, only what did she get two takedowns in this fight just two i think yeah i think so a lot of attempts and a lot of uh time spent in positions where i'm not even sure you'd call them attempts but clearly she was wanting to get an opening for a takedown in those clinches and the only one that succeeded until the very end of the fight really was um a shot takedown <laughs> it wasn't not a judo throw at all a technique that certainly used is at least used to be viable in judo before they outlawed the leg attacks, but uh it was a left hand into a single with like a knee tap finish. Uh All the time she spent trying to force something in the clinch, nothing. But having one strike land and then shooting on the legs, turns out that still works. It's been working for 30, mm-hmm. 30 years in MMA and it still works. Um After that though, she didn't go back to it. She kind of forgot about the shot. Um, and I thought that, uh, Vieta actually sort of, sort of started to f- completely figure out Harrison striking. Like pretty quickly into the second round. She just kind of, Har- Har- she only had the two strikes. And when, and when Harrison did try to mix it up, you really sensed her sort of inexperience on the feet. Because when she tried to add something beyond just the left hand and the left kick she's comfortable with, she she did that thing, the Amir Khan thing, where like one punch looks okay, two punches, you're out of position, three punches, why are you standing like that, like really close to your opponent and very tall and your chin's in the air? Like you just can't keep the form together um, while actually trying to press the attack. And so that just wasn't viable for her to do anything except the two strikes that kind of worked until they didn't. Um, so I would say this should be a huge wake up call for Kayla Harrison, particularly if she's about to get a title shot off of this performance, because she actually struggled mightily with an opponent whose approach was mainly just to be defensive. Yeah. I think we're, we're definitely talking jail to Almeida here. Yeah. Uh, what, what, speaks for her is that she's in a much as we saw essentially yeah uh in the comparison between the main and co-main event she's in a division which is much worse than even like heavyweight or heavyweight yeah no question at least the guys at the very the guys at the very top of heavyweight are not putting on fights like pennington pena i'll tell you that much Mm mm-hmm uh, where they just have no uh, no ideas about how to win. <laughs> yeah, so go yeah, on. being insanely awkward may. I mean, she could theoretically still beat Juliana Pena. 
Sure. Don't see why that would be completely impossible. Pena could In theoretically because, beat herself. Yeah. The Cubs part because I don't think Pena has particularly good takedown defense. I think she's someone who's yep. uh, fought on the understanding that she is she is the grappler. Mm-hmm. That she's just amazing at it. Like when she got guillotined and by because, uh, <laughs> Jermaine Durant. Kayla Harrison is yes, and partially because Kayla Harrison is fucking huge. Yeah, I mean the biggest. Bantamweight, I've ever, women's bantamweight I've ever seen. I mean, almost like certainly. Bigger than, like, bigger than, uh, Nunes. Bigger I'd than Holm. Probably of a comparable size to, like, Cyborg. Yeah. I mean, she's. Just a bit smaller than Cyborg, who never, never could have beaten, never ever could have made 135, but she's just massive. I mean, it's still, still a. just isn't really that big. It's still a wonder that Harrison herself can make 135. She's she's that big. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as I said, I think she's only a tiny bit smaller than Cyborg, to be completely honest. Mm-hmm. I think there have been... She's, she did say something after this fight about how she was, like, missing blood and has various, like, horrific things happen to her during the weight cut, so... Great. Yeah. So pluses and minuses. Uh, a, she's going to be much bigger than anyone she fights... B, it may just kill her. Yeah, and C, her her game is um is a lot closer to one weird trick than you would have liked to think. You know, like you you kind of you kind of thought the Ronda Rousey era is over, and uh, I mean Ronda Rousey is far more well rounded than Kayla Harrison. Let's be honest. I mean, yeah, in a sense, yeah. I, I mean, I, I it's still. A, I mean, she was a better striker. Yeah, no question. Yeah, I mean, I, I to, you know, I will a say, striker, a more diverse takedown artist. Uh, she like had a much more dangerous clinch game outside of, you know, just judo tripping people. She was just like a much better mixed martial artist. Yeah, she was also blinkered in some particular ways. Ronda Rousey never um landed. I'm not saying she was a I'm not saying she was a technical marvel in every Yeah. I I hear you. I said the game like Joe Rogan did, but at least her game like connected together and it was simply the fact that she uh you know, eventually when people did start to stop the takedowns and Strike with her on the feet. She ran into the same basic problems, which is that being better at Kayla than Kayla Harrison on the feet still means you're pretty bad. Yeah, it's not a high bar to clear. <laughs> um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, she genuinely landed like lots of uh, that. Who was it that she finished? Where she like punched into the clinch, and then like she landed like a knee and an elbow, and then. Uh, and then, like, tossed them. That like, was again, like, uh, da- Davis? Of... Alexa Davis? Yeah, I think so. But she had lots of, like, cool transitional elements to her game. Yeah. It's just like, that, like, the, the core was broken. But Kayla Harrison simply looks like someone who is trying to force one skill set through MMA yeah. and doesn't deal with almost any other part of it. Yeah, you want to, I mean, a thing that is very important. Uh, competing at a high level of, of any sport is like, uh, flexibility. Like you can't, Mm -hmm. you can't have a rigid plan that, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, account for whatever, you know, hiccups you will inevitably run into. And so you watch like Pareta and Roundtree. There's a lot of flexibility on display from both of those guys in that fight. They're sort of taking what they're given. They're not trying to, they're not trying too hard to force things. Um, a couple times they try to rush something and they get punished and like, okay, we're going to have to recalibrate. Harrison came across as very inflexible, uh, tactically here that she, the amount of time she spent in those clinches, just like not sure how to force a, how to force a takedown. Uh, and she just kept going back to it and kept trying to force like the same, like inside trip entry. Basically, it just wasn't working. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, she did find the, uh, the sort of weird shot takedowns that she needed to actually bring the fight to the ground. You'd think that would be a lesson for her, right? That like 
the, the throws are maybe something that happens when like a clinch occurs, not something you can necessarily force on every opponent, especially if, uh, as Ketlin Vieira was here, their main goal is just not to let you throw them. Um, so yeah, looks uh, like you're right. Kayla Harrison versus Juliana Pena. These two performances are leading us into a title fight. Yep. <laughs> All right. Shall we wrap it up there? Uh, segment three, we are going to come back. Phil has promised to excoriate me for, um, for just absolutely glazing Mario Batista, which I, I'm, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure I did do that. Uh, we're going to talk about his, uh, contentious win, I guess, over Jose Aldo after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Welcome back. Um, Mario Batista, Jose Aldo. I guess I'll just, uh, I'll just say now, since we're not actually going to talk about it, but we were just discussing uh, Roman Delidze, Kevin Holland. I promise we are not going to talk about it. It does not merit much discussion. All I want to point out is that, uh, um, for as, as dumb as, uh, Daniel Cormier can come across, he also contains, uh, some wisdom. And I really liked that at the end of Holland Delidze, when Kevin's coach was like, well, do you want to fight? He was doing that thing MMA corners do where he's like hemming and hawing and wringing his hands and like incapable yeah, yeah. of making the call. And DC very pointedly said, uh, that decision should not be up to the fighter. In fact, I think I marked it down in my notes. DC said, uh, coach should make this call. He shouldn't let the fighter make the call because Kevin Holland's going to say I can fight when he probably shouldn't. Athletes don't want to say that they're quitting. And, yep. uh, that got to, some, got to a part of that debate, which recurs endlessly in, uh, in this sport because corners are terrible at stopping fights. Uh, and look, the corner did stop the fight. Kevin was clearly incapable. Credit for that. But it's, I, I do like that DC sort of made the point that it's not just about, um, it's not just about like, oh, the fighter's so brave and yada, yada, yada. You can't leave it up to them. It's also that like, you should not put your fighter in a position where they have to say, I quit. Maybe they do want to yeah. quit and you should not let them acknowledge yes. that. You should say, it's in my hands. I know you want to let them feel brave that they've, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, let them be angry and then let them be like, you know, oh yeah, I totally wanted to go out there. Actually, I didn't. Yeah. Psychologically, do not try to prompt your fighter to say that they quit. You make the call. You ask them how they feel. They're going to say good and you can tell they don't feel good. You make the call. So that's all I wanted to say. I appreciated that DC was actually on that. Uh, and uh, I don't know if probably as a corner DC himself would not have the presence of mind to stop a fight either. It's a, it's just a, a weird pervasive thing in this sport, but uh, I appreciated that. And I think that is the attitude more people should take towards uh, corner stoppages. Um, but let's talk about the bantamweights, Mario Batista, yeah, Jose. You've deflected from your shameful enough. Yeah. I'm not ashamed. I uh I thought this was a very good fight for Mario Batista. <laughs> I thought it was a very good fight. And um I uh like I said, I'm I'm pretty glad I managed to call it correctly. It was kind of just a coin flip decision, but I just it was just a, a gut call. I just had a feeling Batista is not the kind of guy to over respect Jose Aldo, and that is really the thing that dooms you to losing to him. And he yep. didn't. He's just going to build and build throughout the fight. And he's not going to end it. Visibly terrified. Giving up on his hopes of being an elite MMA fighter. <laughs> desperately trying to hold. <laughs> I don't Aldo, think... Who has been revealed 
is 50 years old <laughs> up against the cage. I did like that came up on the broadcast, didn't it? They were doing the, the coming to America thing. You know, you know how old Joe Lewis was when he fought Rocky Marziano? Joe Lewis is 137 <laughs> years old. Yeah. What were they saying? <laughs> Gilbert Burns said something that like, when I started yeah, MMA, yeah, yeah. Jose was five years older than me and now he's only one year old. Yeah. Yeah. The, so I think when, when Gilbert Burns said it, it was like two years <laughs> by the time it, it's, it's it inflated. The, yeah. The broadcast booth, it was five. That would make Jose 43. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, amazing. I wouldn't be that shocked. He is a very special athlete. There's no, no doubt about that. He could be 43 and I'd, and I'd be like crazy, but hey, if anybody could do it. Uh, but no 43 year old would, uh, wear that plastic crown. Um, that is true. I, I didn't think Batista was, was scared. I just thought he, he was like, oh, okay. I thought he actually summed it up really well in the post fight interview. He's first of all, he seemed perfectly unashamed of his performance, as I think he should have. Uh, and he uh, he said, "This is something that I talk about a lot. Like how uh, I talk a lot about how uh, fighters go into a fight, how they conceptualize um, their like win conditions, how you conceptualize what is a success." And you see a lot of MMA fighters come in and they want to land a punch. And they miss the punch and it's a failure to them. Or they want to step in and get to a certain range and they get hit and it's a failure to them. And this is, this is when you get the sort of classic, uh, other guy starts coming forward and instantly wins MMA dynamic. But there are a lot of pressure fighters who I'm, I always think of how they, um, they understand that getting hit early, uh, not being able to get your shots off, your takedowns not working, whatever, all of none of those are defeats, right? As long as they all still fit into the fabric of what the whole game plan is. And the game plan accounts for it's going to be really hard to actually get these takedowns, but as long as we go for them, it's going to yield good things. So it's a win. We got him to de- wrestle defensively. That's a win. And that was how Mario Batista was talking after this fight. He was like, yeah, I know... Uh, Jose Aldo, of course, has incredible takedown defense, and uh, and uh, I just wasn't going to let that stop me. I just knew coming in that I was going to miss a lot of takedowns and have a lot of them defended. Uh, and then he also said, um, uh, "Jose didn't get off the cage. That's not my problem," which I kind of liked. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it turned into a little more, uh, a, a quite a bit more of a stinker than it was when it started. First round was fire. But uh, it secured the win for Batista. I can't really hate him for that. It didn't really secure the win, though, did it? It was more like, as you said, it's... I mean, Jose didn't win um, that last round. There's no way he won that last... I don't even know how this one was a split. I thought it was a very... What? He easily won the last... What? You thought Jose clearly won the last round? The last round? Yeah, wasn't that the one where, like, he just, he outstruck Bautista, like, three to one? There was hardly any striking in the last round. Unless my, unless I'm mixing my rounds up, which is possible. Uh. I think it was the second oh, round like, where recall, he, like, the second round, I believe, is when he hurt Bautista's eye. He started backing him up and hitting him with a ton of jabs. And Bautista managed to kind of swing the momentum back by the end. Um, but he was like hurt and getting pressured and Jose w- was taking over. I think that was the second round. Mm-hmm. The third round, it was almost entirely Bautista wrestling Jose against the cage. To my recollection, there were like 30 seconds of Jose getting to come forward and Bautista just kind of blocked everything he threw. I'm pretty sure. I... I cannot look at the stats for this. Oh, I'll do that for you then. So uh, say say what you're going to say then. Go on, lay it on me, and I'll I'll find the stats for you. Um, I mean, just the the game plan for someone like Batista is not obviously to out wrestle. You're not going to be like, oh well, it didn't work for Balashvili. It's going to work for me, Mario Batista. Oh, uh, I'm superior I... wrestler and takedowner to Mirab Devalishvili. 
Well, uh, no, game I don't plan know. was ob- should. Hmm? I, I don't think I, I really don't think his in, his intention was that he was going to. The wrestling was a uh, certainly I mean, it was in the last round. The wrestling was certainly working a little bit more by very small degrees. The longer the fight went on, he found that uh, like ankle pick counter to Jose doing the sort of like lazy man knee to the thigh block, putting his uh, instep on his calf. And uh, and Batista started trying to draw that out, going for the knees to the leg and then reaching down to take the ankle. He got Jose down for about 0.2 seconds on two occasions mm-hmm. with that move. He still didn't break through the defense. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he um, thought he was going to out-wrestle Jose in that way. I think he thought he was going to make Jose defend, which he did. Jose yeah, did, I'm just, sure. I've defended people who have... Uh... Like, had fights where they've just burned huge amounts of the clock, taking advantage of how horrifically passive Jose is in the clinch. Yeah. You know, Volkanovski. Yep. Um, Duolish really. Himself. Yep. Even Kenny Florian to an extent back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, but, like, this was not one of those, because in those fights, you were at least like, oh, yeah, he's actually clearly winning. There is a time for stalling, and it is when you are winning. <laughs> yeah, that is the that is what I did not like about this. Is that your if he'd really gone for it, I'm pretty sure Mar- uh, Batista could have drowned Aldo. I he think so. Actually, I I he wasn't agree with that. Tired. No, I agree with that. But I think like, he, I think he should have leaned on the striking more late in the fight. I fully agree with that. Yeah, like it, instead he made he he started going for the stalling like he had rounds in the back and he he absolutely didn't he just threw it up in the air and uh, basically offered it to the judges uh to uh score it not even correctly but just to like flip a coin and have it land the right way yeah so what do the stats look like for this fight um stats for Batista outstrikes Aldo in the first round 20 to 13 Second round, 21 for Aldo. Fair Second round, 21 for Aldo, 19 for Batista. As I said, the, the yeah. Aldo had a huge momentum swing and then it kind of swung back right the other way after Batista kind of settled. Um, round three, they credit Aldo with 17 to Batista's 10. Yeah. Uh, that's what I said, like he, he actually outstrikes him quite clearly in the third round. I'm not, uh, again, I'm not being a, a fight site Aldo Homer. I just remember that. There's a lot of very empty clinch work. and There certainly get, is. Like, I don't know if I could tell you where those 17 strikes came from either, though. I mean, he just outstrikes him fairly cleanly. I didn't, I didn't think it was like a controversial round to score at all when I was watching it. Wow. Well, see, I was totally disengaged it from the... It just looked like this a is, loser desperately hanging on. This, this must be a d- debate that's been... Surely this has been a debate that's been raging since the event <laughs> that I've just not been party to, right? Just I, I, I'm assuming so. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be an event though, because there's like they're mostly in completely separate camps where uh, some people simply be incredibly f- furious, and other people will just be like, "Well, yeah, I suppose so." Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna have to look at that third round and see if I can find the uh, 17 strikes of Jose's and and uh, determine how uh, significant they were because. I didn't, I didn't see him landing that many strikes. He got a couple jabs off. A lot of them slipped. Batista didn't land many strikes either. Um, but the round I mean, was. Yeah. I mean, I'm imagining like most of, uh, uh, Batista's strikes in that round were the shoulder bumps that he was landing. Those were mostly cage. in round two, I think. Yeah. He landed a few in round three. I'm not even well. sure if those get counted as significant strikes. They, they seem to have pretty good impact, but I'm not sure what the, uh, the cutoff is on uh, on uh, UFC stats for uh, clinch strikes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I thought I thought um, a good performance from Batista, where also he could have uh, he. It was a bit like um, do you remember Jonathan Martinez fought? Um, was it Saeed Nurmagomedov? I think. Uh, yeah. Any, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any recollection of that fight? I, it felt a bit yeah, like yeah, that. Where, the one, 
Mar- Martinez, you know, the, the speed was a, he, Martinez had a less convincing start than Batista did. I, again, I thought Batista hit exactly the right tone in the first round of this. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. When I saw that first round, I was just like, Oh yeah, he's going to win. I'm, I'm, I'm also glad I picked Mara Batista. And then by the end of the fight, I was just like, Oh, Connor lied to me. This guy sucks. He doesn't suck, Phil, but I definitely thought that he came in super confident. Um, and then he d- decided, I think perhaps a little incorrectly about halfway through the fight that, uh, cause I, I certainly believe he's he, just not good at striking. <laughs> he is good at striking. He, he, he just decided, <laughs> he just decided, you know what? This isn't for me. I did expect this him. man who is 55 years old, <laughs> just too scary. <laughs> I'm going to spend this round alternately backpedaling and clinching. I am the new Kayla Harrison. This man who's about to get a significant discount at the dinner, the buffet dinner <laughs> he goes to after this event gets an AARP discount. Um, I did expect Bautista to wrestle. Uh, and I do think that yeah, was, sure. I think that was I part of yeah, the, I would have expected some kind of synthesis. Of, uh, he wrestles yeah, everybody. The Volkanovsky game, the Volkanovsky and Holloway game plans. Yeah. And it's just who Batista is too. He wrestles everybody. I mean, by the end of his fight with Damon mm-hmm. Blackshear, who's a big, strong wrestler grappler, he's taken him down. He was taken down. I just would have expected that that wasn't, he wouldn't like have decided that's all that he is. Yeah. He did. He sort of put his head down a bit also like, um, DC Jones won. Where Cormier like sort of just got it in his head that he had to complete a takedown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Pride thing. Yeah, I think that 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 was kind of how I saw it. Uh, more so that it was like this is an easy thing that he's going to have to keep defending me, and I am going to get one. And like I said, he got a little closer. He still wasn't really out wrestling him. But uh, I, I think don't know. he mostly, you know, I think he's he's got a. Uh, to be honest, I think he has a good sense of. He probably mostly has a good sense of how to like how to win fights. Yeah, he was probably thinking, "Oh, well, I am I am controlling this guy." It was it was incredibly empty in that last round, and yeah, there was just like a couple moments where he was just getting chased around the cage, getting punched by Aldo. And yeah, Cer- certainly. Yeah, uh, again, in the like first half of the second round, Aldo mm-hmm. did not like the way the first round had gone and came out, and the jab was on fire uh, in that particular couple of minutes there he he cut batista's eye he was backing him up keeping him on the end of the reach but then he, even then you could see halfway through the round aldo starts to get tired he just can't keep up this pace and he starts kind of trying to like uh make up for it with swagger he starts like dropping his hands and like he's just slipping and trying to make batista look silly mm-hmm. but it actually lets batista back into the fight yep um so yeah, I guess I'll have to go find out how pissed everyone is at Mario Batista. <laughs> I wasn't really mad at him. <laughs> I mean, I think they're just they're just used to it by now. I think they again, it, it's one of these things where it's happened enough times. It's just a way to beat Aldo, uh, you know. It just is. You just hold him up against the cage, and he's he's just he's just not going to do anything. Yeah. Again, this is the only time where someone's done it, and I'm like, I don't actually think you won the round that, the round that you did that in, but. I can't fault someone for trying to integrate it into their game plan because it's just super obviously a thing that you should do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm usually of the opinion that if, uh, unless something significant happens, you can win a round by controlling somebody with wrestling or grappling. I think you usually agree with me on that too, right? Like top position is, but just not necessarily like pushing someone in like, you, it's got to be really empty for you to push, win a round by pushing someone in. Yeah. I, I personally did not see, uh, the margin of striking success from Jose to, to even think that, uh, he had won that round. But, uh, just goes to show different sort of <laughs> biases you might take into a viewing experience that color your, uh, your perception of the scoring. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Jose still looks as good as he has. Has to be said. Yeah. Um, I also think he definitely, we saw more of the, uh, penetrability. Is that a word of his defense that we saw in that fight with Martinez? 
where the the slick yeah. head movement alone was not actually keeping a lot of the shots out. I do wish Batista had just kept on with what he was doing in round one because like the double jabs, he was landing the right hands, hooking off the jab. Uh, the takedowns just mixed. He just realized he's not. He's just not made for that. He won the round. I mean, that's <laughs> he won the round just, though. Yeah, didn't but he? then it just he just ran out of the just ran out of ideas. And he was like, "I'm Kayla Harrison now." <laughs> <laughs> this seventy-five-year-old man has cowed me. I'm only going up in year in five year increments. Every <laughs> yeah, time. I decided I'd go for a bigger jump. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I'm actually kind of eager now when we're done talking here to go look on 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 Twitter and find out like how pissed all of the sort of oh yeah, there's gonna be some. There's gonna be. Some, they're gonna be mad. There's still gonna be some quality theory, even though it has happened a few times before. Yeah, I, I think didn't I'm even do that as well. I didn't even think of that. Um, I, I was honestly stunned to hear you say you thought uh, Aldo had won that round. It didn't even cross my mind. I'll have to rewatch it and see if I can see it from that perspective. I'm sure there's something there because it is a lot of empty nothing from Batista. There's no question about that. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, uh, that was uh, UFC 307. I thought, um, you know what? I felt uh, this probably benefited greatly from the next day viewing experience. I got to skip through all the bullshit. Uh, in fact, I was stunned at the length of time that elapsed between the end of Pena Pennington and the start of Pereira Roundtree. I swear there's like a half hour on my fucking video file before they actually get on to the next fight. It's amazing. But... Um, I thought it had a, it had the right amount of variety for me to enjoy it. I thought the main event was phenomenal. I thought Batista Aldo was fun, and uh, and then all the other stuff was just sort of the vegetables that went with my my entree and my dessert, basically. I can take uh... a I can take a Pena Pennington in the context of Pereira Roundtree and Batista Aldo. In that context, it's like yeah, it was, this is it was, it was a mixed bag. This I is think. different, yes, very much so. Yeah, Harrison Vieira and Pena Pennington were, were just not very good. It's yeah, particularly. Let's say, let's say Holland, you know, could have been fun and silly, but then it just it just randomly ended. Yeah, uh, yeah, but he still though was was genuinely very fun. Yeah. Um, and even if it petered out, uh, yep. And uh, yeah, Pereira Roundtree Junior was fantastic, but it, it it does also go to show like how much a a big fun main event can sort of change your absolutely yeah of a card very very much so yeah. I mean, I feel watching it Pereira Roundtree was one of the best fights of the year. Like it wasn't a yeah. it wasn't a barn burner all the way through like uh, that uh, Rebovich. Zellhuber fight was at UFC 306, but like I said, a, a lot of my favorite fights are this, they strike this kind of tone. The two way technical, tactical battle, uh, just two fighters who are really locked in, standing at like close range, trying to solve each other. I love that kind of fight. A genuine chess match between Pereira and Roundtree. I was very, very happy to watch that one. And, uh, Genuinely very, very, very good. Yeah. And I think that'll do it for uh, this week's episode of Heavy Hands. I am going to try to uh, knock something out quick on uh, Potato Roundtree, which means uh, next week, <laughs> make sure you check out facepunching.substack.com <laughs> for my breakdown. Um, Heavy Hanka is finally up on the Heavy Hands Patreon. Uh, well after the fact, but we are going to be more timely uh, when we get to the next sumo tournament miguel and i which is coming up because we took so long to organize this which is now coming up in just about a month so uh make sure you head over to the heavy hands patreon you want to hear miguel class and i spend well over an hour talking about the sumo that happened in september and find us on twitter at evil greg jackson that's phil at boxing bush that's me until next week, when we will be discussing Brandon Royval versus Tatsuro Tyra, uh, which is not, it's not the worst Apex card I've ever seen. I'll say that. It's, huh? it's actually got some pretty good fights on it. So uh, until then, 
If you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. <laughs> <laughs>